I'm going to dumb it down. I'm going to talk about some of the same stuff, but at like a maybe a Donald Trump level. Maybe, maybe even lower. I don't know. And the way we're going to start is by talking about Hannah. And this is appropriate because in the, in the uh, handout syllabus itinerary, I'm listed as Zubina Demania, which is in fact an upgrade to the superior sex. Hannah Montana, when we go into our careers, especially in healthcare, don't we feel like her? We're just bright eyed and idealistic and hella Disney all around, right? Like we're gonna use our unique talents to help people and change the world. And y'all know where this is going. Because at some point, I don't know, for me it was in residency, filling out forms, dealing with insurance companies, dealing with the Health 2.0 system that we were just talking about, actually, which for physicians and clinicians and human beings is actually feel, makes us feel like a commodity. And, so, and then one day we look in the mirror and what we see has changed. We are a twerk in progress, this entire, so <laughs> we are broken and, and dispirited. And, and in healthcare in particular, this is much more common than this. This lasts for maybe a week and then it's like bam. And I had another slide that I deleted because I was told there weren't a lot of clinicians in here. But the next slide was, was, was a horrible x-ray of something very bad in the rectum. And that's really what it, I know, but the joke was there was a right prosthetic hip that everyone missed. And the idea is, it's funny, I'm telling you about this freaking slide. I should have just put the damn slide in, right? So everyone misses this hip because they're so focused on the elephant in the rectum uh, that they miss the big picture. And in healthcare, the big picture is the why, the heart and soul, the human relationship that we're using all the technology that we're talking about in this conference to actually empower. And at the heart of that is this analog heart of medicine. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. It's going to start as always with the rather egomaniacal protagonist setting the stage by trying to find identity. So in the Greek tragedies, you always see this, you know, the person goes on this quest to find out who they are and comes back a changed person. For me, we're in the 21st century. We're in health 2.0, as Tom pointed out. And so I said, I could figure out my identity with uh, genetics. Like, let's just do 23 and me. You all know about this thing, right? You know, it's like 99 bucks, you spit in a cup, they run your genome, the FDA shuts you down, you play nice, you say the right things, you get started back up again, and here you go. So I actually did it back in the day, 99 bucks, spit in the cup, and found out some interesting things. I found out that I am at lower than average risk for male pattern baldness. <laughs> so already I'm like z dog one gene zero, son. I'm ahead of the game. But then I found out some other really interesting things. I found out that the person, it, I did the ancestry part, the person who raised me as my father, you know where this is going, told me he was my dad. And we all know somebody who had this happen. I, I do the test and I find out without a shadow of a doubt that he is in fact my actual freaking father. I don't even see the, I always thought I was adopted. Like, I don't know, I mean, I just assumed like it, this can't be. Like here's a guy from India, immigrant, physician, and then there's me, man, I'm a gangsta. No, he's my dad. And it turned, well, here's the thing. So he, he's a physician from India. My mother, he's an internal medicine doctor. My mother is a psychiatrist from India, which explains pretty much the entire mess that you see in front of you. It also explains for the doctors in the audience why I was always grounded as a child in exactly 72 hour increments. <laughs> Took me years to figure that out, mom. But the thing is when both your parents are immigrant physicians from India, it's like being named Jeeves. You're gonna be a butler. Like there was no doubt I was gonna be a doctor. It was just guaranteed. And those of us with immigrant parents know that there is no test they will not criticize, even a freaking blood test. <laughs> <sighs> and
and, you know, it's funny. So my wife, I married a, a um, Chinese woman whose parents are both doctors, and actually one's a doctor, one's a nurse. And her dad, uh, but, they, but they grew up in South Carolina, Columbia, South Carolina. And so her dad once spent an hour trying to convince me that General Lee was Chinese. That's how extreme these guys were. I might have even been convinced by the end. So here is my dad, all right? Now, when I'm growing up, I'm realizing that I'm passionate about music. I'm passionate about making people laugh because I was the short kid with the funny last name that gets misspelled Zubina, even now. And I had to compensate, and the way I did is I tried to put people at ease by making people laugh. And I loved music. And so, of course, my idol was freaking Weird Al. And I had a poster of Weird Al on my wall, which meant even less social happiness for me, because that's apparently not good with the chicks. And I told my dad at that time, I said, you know, Dad, like, when I grow up, I want to, like, I, I like to teach. I like to make people laugh. I like to do music. I, I, uh, and he looks at me, and he does this thing that Indian guys do. If you've ever seen Peter Russell, he does this really well. It's and he says... Being a professional clown won't put naan on the table, okay? <laughs> Do you, you know what I'm saying? Do you want to be a man? Because if you want to be a man, then you come and see what a real man does for a living, and you come to my clinic. And I had no choice, because, you know, as Peter Russell says, somebody's going to get hurt if you, if you do. <laughs> so, so I go to the clinic, and this is what I see. This is in the Central Valley of California in the 80s. Here's a primary care physician who trained in India at a time when there was no MRIs and CTs and Theranos BS blood tests that don't actually work. There was the touch and the feel and the intuition and the art of human relationship-driven medicine. And I saw him do this in his Central Valley Clinic where he saw Medicaid patients because he had a funny last name and no one would send other patients to him. So he saw the patients no one wanted to see. And he would do things for them that just blew my mind. He knew the entire family. And, 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 and I fell in love with this. And um, I mean, I remember one time he, he, he went to the abdomen of this woman who was having abdominal pain. And I was like, Dad, we should order an ultrasound. And he's like, ultrasound. No wonder you idiot Americans are spending the 2.8 trillion on the healthcare and getting the worst outcomes in the developed world. You are thinking the money is growing on trees only. And I was like, what the hell is this about? He goes up to the belly. He goes, why do you think my ears are so big? Because I listen. Goes to the abdomen and he goes, It is a boy, <laughs> roughly six weeks, crown to rump length, seven centimeters. I'm like, did you just echolocate that child <laughs> with your bat Indian ears? Did you just do that right now? Because that is, I want to do what you do when I grow up. That is the dopest thing I've ever seen in my life. To which, of course, he replied, you are the dopest thing I've ever seen in my life. Don't you want to do primary care? What are you, an idiot? Go listen to me, listen to me. What I do in this clinic, nobody pays for, okay? These bastards. And whenever he did this, he was talking about insurance companies or the government or both. <laughs> Often both. These bastards, they don't pay you to do what I do, to hold the hand, to develop the relationship, to go to the house, to understand the human being because so much of what is happening is here. And they don't pay you to do things for people. They are paying you to do things to people, especially to the rectum. <laughs> Listen, there are 5,000 rupees in everybody's colon. Just take a scope and fish it out. Do the GI, be a specialist. Listen, you know your uncle Bupinder, okay? He is the GI all day. The patient is unconscious, and he's in their buttocks playing video games. <laughs> and do you know what Bupinda drives? Lexus. 
all day i am talking to the patient filling out the forms understanding why they are not taking the medications helping with the social situation talking to the grandmother who's at home taking care of the young person and what am i driving camry <laughs> fabric interior <laughs> i said dad you know a camry is really just a more sensible version of a lexus you shut up and don't talk back you idiot you are always trying to do the hippity hop, rippity rap nonsense, okay? Why don't you just learn the rules and play by them? Kiss the right buttocks, okay? One day you will reach the apex of medicine. CEO of a hospital. And I said, that, that doesn't sound great to me. Shut up and don't talk back. And with that, I decided to go to medical school. But I hedged, I hedged, because I still loved music, so I did a double thing. I did music at Berkeley and molecular biology as the pre-med. Now in the music part, I got to play African drums on the quad with the cool kids and feel dialed into the unitary consciousness that pervades the entire universe. In the pre-med part, I got to hang out with the dude who brought his own folding chair to class so he could sit in front of the front row. Uh, Berkeley was very competitive. They never found his body. It was just, uh... <laughs> you know, and I'm not even joking. This guy's name was Arash, because I no longer care. And I recently Googled him, and he didn't get into medical school. He ended up going to business school, and his LinkedIn avatar is his yacht. And so for those of us who did actually survive the pre-med game and go to medical school, so often and so many days, it felt like this. <laughs> so how many doctors here? Yeah, just like, yeah, a few, a few, right? So medical school is one of those things that has totally bypassed the Enlightenment. It's like, it's, it's stuck in the Greek era, where the first two years you just memorize a butt ton of data, and then the second two years, you learn to kiss the ring of the authority figure so you can progress to the next level, so that one day you can be the ring that is kissed. That is medical school for you. I remember we, we I mean, it, there was a, uh, a rotation in third year of medical school. I was at UCSF in San Francisco, and we wore the short white coats, and the attending physician wore the long white coat and you only speak if you're spoken to, and we're there on ICU rounds in my short white coat, and it's a big team. And this attending physician, who for the purposes of this talk, we'll just call him Dr. Flanders, uh, because that was in fact his real name. <laughs> and I no longer care, I just don't. So Flanders said, there are no stupid questions. Well, Dr. Flanders was a freaking liar, because I asked a question, to which Dr. Flanders in front of the entire team responded and the nurses were there and there were patients wheeling by and everybody, you could feel the record kind of go <laughs> He goes, Demania, you speak and then think. I would like you to reverse that. Or better yet, just think. And you could feel the air sucked out of the room and you could hear the thoughts of the other medical students on the rotation. Only one of us four could get honors in this rotation. You could hear them going, yes, he's ruined his career. And I felt like, I, you know, I saw uh, Sully, uh, Ch Chesley Sullenberger, the guy who landed the plane in the Hudson speak. If you've ever seen him speak, it's one of the most beautiful things you'll ever see. You'll come away inspired. He describes the moment that the birds hit the engines. And he says, I'm sitting in the cockpit, and it felt like my entire world dropped out from under me because you, you lose thrust and you smell the birds burning. You could smell them in the cockpit. And he plays the FAA tape of the cockpit voice thing, and you the whole time you're just like, oh my God. And that's what it felt like in a, in a microcosm for me because all of medical school was this kind of race to outcompete your peers so that you could be the most empathic doctor and help people. It's total horse crap, right? So <laughs> at this point, I'm like, I've ruined my career. And the pharmacy student comes up to me and she puts her hand on my shoulder afterwards because she could tell I was like ready to cry. And she looks me in the eye and I'm like, you know, empathy is not just the domain of physicians. It's about a team that supports each other. And she looked me in the eye and says, um, I think Flanders hates you. <laughs> 
and pointed and laughed. And at this point, I was pretty messed up. But go through two more weeks, I sit down for my review evaluation session with Dr. Flanders. And I tell you all this again as a way of illustrating this is how doctors are made, all right? This is why we're so weird. So, or at least why I'm so weird. And that and the psychiatry mom. Um, he sits down and he goes, where to begin? And I was like, dental school? I don't know. It's, uh, it's looking ugly right now. Uh, and he said, look, uh, Zubin, you don't respect the hierarchy that is medicine. The fact that you wear a short white coat and I wear a long white coat. You're on rounds making jokes, you're comfortable, you're talking out of turn, you're doing all these things that really is, it's not acceptable for a student. It's hurt you on this rotation. And it's gonna hurt you throughout your career. And you know, at this point I'm like, <laughs> you know that, that face you make when like, someone's trying to break up with you and you're trying not to cry? And you're just like. <laughs> I was doing that. I'm like, no, nah, this guy's not going to see me wuss out, because I don't care. I just don't care. And, uh, and then he says, but here's the thing. Um, I went and talked to the rest of your team, all those medical students and interns and residents that were on the team with you. And they said, you used humor as a way to put people at ease, never at anyone's expense, always targeting above authority-wise. And, and it brought people together. And you treated each of them like they were the most important person on the team. And it, guess what? The nurses said the same thing, that you knew their names, that you treated them like they were the most important person on the team taking care of that patient. And then I talked to the person who make the, makes and delivers the food and the clerk and even the janitor, and they all knew who you were, which was crazy because you treated them like they were the most important person on the team. And then I talked to the patients, and the patients said that you did this thing where you sat down you turned off the computer and you listened like they were the only person present in the universe for the time you were there with them. And that was the exception to their experience in the hospital. And so for this reason, I think you understand what medicine is about. It's about human relationships working together for the benefit of another human being. And it's for that reason that it's against my better judgment, but I'm forced to give you honors in this rotation. And you know, at this point, like a tear does start to come down. And then I sucked it back up. Because I wasn't gonna lose street cred because then I'd have to kill a man to get it back and I'm not going back to jail. I'm just not, I'm not. And, and then Flanders told me something interesting. He said, listen, I know what it's like. You don't like this system. I don't either. Here's the thing, learn the rules, get through it, play by the rules, later you can break them. And I remembered that, and I was inspired for a minute, where I was like, this could work. I could be Hannah Montana, still. And then I went into my career, after residency training and a lot of changes in my brain, not all for the better, uh, a lot less empathy, a lot more burnout. And then what I realized was after 10 years at Stanford as a hospital doctor, that most of my patients, and Tom talked about this very eloquently, most of my patients looked like this. I know, adorable, right? Wrong. This is what I saw, okay? Most people, oh, it's Winnie the Pooh. That's great, man, cute. Tigger. This is what I see. I see an anxious affect and facial expressions concerning for depression with anxiety features. ICD-10, 260.XD3, um, acute first episode. I see a black necrotic nose concerning for likely cocaine toxicity and ingestion. <laughs> Again, acute episode likely with chronic history. I forget the ICD-10 code, so I gotta look it up. Um, I see a central abdominal obesity concerning for likely early metabolic syndrome with insulin resistance and early diabetes. Confirmed and supported by the complete absence of fingers and toes on every extremity concerning for diabetic polyneuropathy with autoamputation, and despite his name, he hasn't. <laughs> concerning for hypo, hypothyroidism and diabetic-related gastropathy with constipation, and despite this litany of metabolic glucose-related complaints, Mr. Pooh presents with his auto-amputated right paw deep in a jar of high fructose honey. <laughs> and I've got maybe, maybe 15 minutes to see Mr. Pooh as a new patient. 
And I go, uh, Mr. Pooh, you are diabetic. You are fat. You should lose weight and walk. Oh, and by the way, here's five different medications. Here's six different tests we're going to order for you. We're going to admit you to the hospital for seven different days, send you to eight different specialists, amputate that last little bit of black toe on that right paw, and uh, see you back in a month. Oh, and I almost forgot. Here's a glucometer. Check your sugar four times a day. Keep a log and bring it back. Bye-bye. And guess what? Then I bill a 99234 or whatever the code is, and I get paid like 40 bucks. And the whole time I'm like, man, I didn't do anything for that guy. He's going to be. And guess what happens? In a month, if Mr. Pooh comes back, he comes back. Those five medications, he's taken five medications. Actually, no, he's taking one medication five times because he didn't understand, and the others weren't covered. And no one could fill out the prior auth in the office because someone dropped the ball. And then, um, despite having amputated that last bit of toe and having a series of infections, he weighs five pounds more. <laughs> and he's using his glucometer to text his homies. <laughs> With success, I may add. <laughs> and at this point, the resident that I'm supervising turns to the medical student and whispers in an audible voice to Mr. Pooh, hey, check it out. You can't cure stupid. We never gave Mr. Pooh a chance, right? Because I was incentivized to do things to Pooh, not for Pooh, right? That just doesn't sound right when it comes out of my mouth. <laughs> the incentives were all wrong. And so what happens is, no one is incentivized to say, hey, Mr. Pooh, what hole in your life is that honey filling that you will eat it even though it is killing you? Do you live in a food desert where it's the cheapest thing? As a system, have we taken honey where it historically has been in trees guarded by bees where only bears could obtain it at great personal cost and put it in a supermarket where only poor people can, where poor people can afford it as the only thing they can afford? And what's going on with your social structure, the Hundred Acre Woods. Where's Christopher Robin, man? He's your homie. He's totally AWOL, son. And what's going on with Piglet? Is there abuse? <laughs> and uh, be honest, be honest, let's look at it carefully. Have you, Mr. Pooh, been dipping into Tigger's crystal meth stash? I'm just saying, he has no teeth, people. <laughs> he broke bad in like 1970. And don't even get me started on Eeyore. I don't even know how you get a scar like that. And so it's demoralizing because our system is not set up to take care of this. And then we complain, like Tom did, when these patients, the 20% of creatures in the 100 Acre Woods, cost us 80% of our healthcare dollars. We can't handle them, we don't know what to do. And as a result, at Stanford, I would play this game with the residents. Hey, of all the patients on the ward right now that we've admitted, how many actually need to be here? If they just had good preventative care, what's a number? Never more than 50%, never more, often less. Didn't need to be there if they just had good preventative care that took the entire 100 acre woods into context. And the whole time you're seeing Mr. Pooh, you're worried that Pooh's gonna sue if I don't order 100 tests. And you've got an electronic health record that makes you wanna poke your eyes out Right? And so all this is happening. And in this context, eight years into my career, this comes to me. Now, this is purportedly my daughter. But the 23 in me is still inconclusive. So I'm reserving judgment. But she's cute, so I'll take her. She clearly takes after my wife. She, she finds my stethoscope, pulls it out of my bag, and walks up to me and says, Daddy, when I grow up, I want to be a doctor like you so I can help people too. And it was not my first instinct to tell her what a sacred calling you've chosen to be with people when they're at their most vulnerable and to give a piece of yourself in return. What a sacred gift it is. It was my first instinct to freaking ground her <laughs> for exactly 72 hours as a danger to... I mean, it was, and then I realized, oh, okay, what's going on? Why, why am I doing this? Like, this is very paternalistic. Let me... If there was a bring your daughter to work day, I could show her what I do. 
But if I did that, she would come back with Clostridium difficile infection. So I said, how about this? I'll just describe to you what my day is like, and then you can make an educated decision at age five as to whether you want to do this for a career. How's that? Okay, let's do this. 4 a.m., you wake up. There's no Dora. There's no SpongeBob. There's just 40 voicemails signing out sick, complicated, scared patients and the millions of administrative tasks that you have to do to get through your day. You then get into the hospital at maybe 5.30 a.m., where you do a series of five-minute U-turns at the foot of the bed of patients who are having the worst day of their lives, who've been waiting on pins and needles to see you for 24 hours, the nurse has been promising you're gonna come, and you do them the service of a five minute U-turn, if that, at the foot, of, sometimes from the door, why? Why? No, none of that sitting down and being present like they're the only person in the universe. No Hannah Montana crap. This is straight Miley Cyrus twerking, because you go back to the EHR where you spend five hours clicking fricking boxes in a health 2.0 world to please a fricking bean counter who has never touched a patient in their lives and who is putting quality measures on you that you cannot possibly measure up to because there's not enough time in the day and you're not incentivized to do it and it's a train wreck and you do this and this electronic health record despite its name epic isn't it is two, it is two keystrokes. I used it for 10 freaking years. It is two keystrokes away from becoming sentient and destroying the human race. It is a glorified cash register with some patient stuff thrown on it. And I know there are people in this room who are gonna hate that I said that, but that's just too freaking bad. It sucks and I think we can do better. And all of this is going on and then what happens? You go back, it's like seven o'clock at night and you listen to another 40 vo voicemails. And they're from administrators and consultants and other people telling you to do more and more with less and less while improving patient satisfaction, which at this point is a freaking oxymoron to you because you gave that, that one patient that you refused to give narcotics to because it was wrecking their lives, just went on Yelp and ripped you a new one. And you're on voicemail 41 and you're trying to delete it, star six pound and it won't delete and you're like star six pound and you're like now I'm gonna have to call IT <laughs> and sit on the phone to delete this freaking voicemail, okay? And you're like why is this voicemail getting angry? That's strange, star six pound. And now it's really mad, star six pound. And then you realize it's not a freaking voicemail. It's a live person. <laughs> and it gets worse because then you realize, no, it's your wife. <laughs> and, uh, and she's called you asking, when are you gonna be home? Because your daughter wants to see you before bed, wants you to read a bedtime story. You finally get home, you miss the bedtime by five minutes, but it doesn't matter because it, your brain is still at work, reliving all that sea of 30 patients that you saw. Did I miss something that's gonna injure or kill another human being, wrecking me emotionally, financially, spiritually for the rest of my life? So you go back to Epic and you chart for another three hours before bed to make sure you didn't miss anything. Lather, rinse, repeat for an entire career. Is that what you want, little girl, to help people? To which she wisely replied, I think I shall just be a princess instead. <laughs> so I was back here, right? I thought I paid my dues. I played by the rules, man. But guess what? I forgot something that Flanders told me. He's like, then you can break them. I was in a system where I felt like a failure and it was a personal failure. So like 60% of doctors won't recommend the career to their kids, 60%. Could you say that about engineers? Or even lawyers would probably recommend the career sooner to their kids than doctors. And why is this? Because our system is so fundamentally at odds with why we went in, with our Hannah Montana. And so as a result, I was deeply burned out and I didn't even know it. Do you know how I found out I was burned out? Some people go buy a you know, sports car and have affairs and do all these things, get emotionally distant. I started winning teaching awards because I was like the fat man from House of God, if you've ever read that. I was the voice of truth. So I would use my humor, which before had brought people together, was never at anyone's expense, was breaking down walls. I was using it to build a wall to cope and the residents and the interns freaking loved it because it was funny because it was true. But I was poisoned by this culture and I was poisoning everyone around me. It was a total mess. And, you know, and then what would happen is th the great health 2.0 revolution was coming and it was needed. But this is how I responded to it. Toyota sent some representatives to teach us lean. And I tell the house staff, I'm like, hey, guys, uh, check it out. 
Toyota and these car companies could learn something from us. How dare they try to, to teach healthcare what to do? Like how to name their cars. Like wouldn't you buy the Nissan Exima? <laughs> when you're itching to peel out. <laughs> the Toyota Melina in tarry black. Fine, fine. I know they're pretty stupid. I, it was dumb, but I, I won't. Um, I won't tell you about the Honda Foreskin then. <laughs> it, it's a convertible with a soft retractable top. That it it got real. It wasn't it wasn't good, and so 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 at the bottom of my burnout, I was using humor as a coping mechanism. And I was, you know, going home and crying in the shower because then no one would know I was crying because it was already wet. I mean, it was a mess, man. It wasn't good. And, and the whole time I'd forgotten the whole second part of Flanders' thing. And I think that was part of my burnout is I felt something was deeply wrong. I was, in the, I was living someone else's life, right? I was living my dad's life, what he wanted, what, what society wanted, and yet that was broken. So as a result, what ended up saving me in the end was what I had previously discounted as the greatest threat to our way of life the world has ever known. And you guys know what I'm talking about, the millennial generation. So these kids start swarming on the wards, and I'm supervising them. And I'm like, what is going on with these people? They're like an alien race. Like, yet yeah, they're lazy and entitled and spoiled, yes. But they're also incredibly optimistic. They're using technology in really unique and innovative ways to make life easier, but also to connect with people through social media. And it's a totally different world for them. They see the future as very bright. They want work-life balance. They want to take care of patients, leveraging technology to leverage the human relationship. They kind of got it. But the problem was all their little texting and stuff on the wards, their little acronyms. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this in a chart. I saw this, they show up in the chart at work. Like I saw this in a medical chart. OMG, patient with GI bleed, found down in stool, LOL. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Like everybody, everybody knows this is a joint commission violation, right? <laughs> they, would, they would say right away, you always, always, always spell out gastrointestinal. <laughs> I mean, really, people. <laughs> And so here they were, and I was learning from them, and I was like, man, I could use technology to try to do something that helps me reconnect with patients. It was a total mess. Like, I almost lost my admitting privileges at Stanford just for checking my Hotmail account at work. This is a movement we're trying to start. I don't think we have all the answers at all. We need help. We need everybody to do their part to try to get us to health 3.0 in whatever way we can, because it needs to happen. We called it turntable health, not because everybody in Las Vegas is a DJ in addition to their day job, which is in fact true. Um, in fact, one guy is the CEO of uh, UMC Hospital. He also spins at the wind on the weekends. It's just a thing. The reason we called it turntable health is because people who remember records who are old enough or people who are young enough to have rediscovered them, know that an album has a piece of art, you hold it in your hand, it has 13 tracks that tell a beautiful story together, cohesively. You put it down on a platter in a ritual and you drop the needle and you sit with your friends and this warm analog sound washes over you and you're together with other human beings experiencing the deep humanity that's music. Now let's contrast that because I think that is the beating heart of medicine. It's analog. You can plug into all the digital stuff to empower it. But if the heart, the analog heart, is abused and discounted, you can't win. Because I think right now, we're turning medicine into an MP3 that is zeros and ones ripped off the internet, out of context, one track from the album, blaring into earbuds on a subway, isolated from the rest of humanity. Is that the best game we can play in healthcare? I don't think so. So we called a turntable to bring the heart back and I think anybody who can do that is on our team and should, should join us. Um, I'm gonna wrap up the uh, talk part of it um, because there's only so much you can do uh, on the talking side. And uh, this joke clearly only works on doctors. 
Usually I get a big laugh from this one. They're like, rhabdomyolysis. You guys are like, what the hell is rhabdomyolysis? It's muscle break. That's a long story. But I'm curious, do you guys want to hear a little poem I wrote about um, electronic health records? <laughs> I have no idea if this is going to work because I didn't do a sound check, but uh, you know, poetry reading should be relatively simple. Yo. Yeah. Yeah, I'm out that paper. No more chasing med records. Writing so illegible that I'll be hip up forever. Bought the new software. And though we use it here, I can't use it over there. Different systems everywhere. I used to chart on paper. All of my verbals recorded, mixed up with the ward clerk. Turned diluted to dilaud and switched me to that EMR. Meaningless abuse. G now catch me at the nurse's station mashing that F2 key. Those used to be our story. Narrative, but yo, replaced with copy paste. Now a bloated ransom note. Me, I'm at that bedside. Focus like a laser beam on the patient. Now, come on, I'm treating the computer screen. Eight dozen warnings, click check boxes. Alarm fatigue, Vaseline conflicts with doxy. Nurses, they be burned out. We could use some OT. Tell by our wrist guards that we most definitely on, yeah, on, yeah. on. Ah, hey. yeah. Right, right. Uh huh, uh huh. You stuck, son. Phone with IT, begging tech support. Shoot, it's like IT and me be stuck in 1994. Innovation all around, but it ain't in healthcare. Internet and apps for you, but we get ancient software. Welcome to the EHR. Go live and it don't stop. Uncle Sam promoted it, but gone is the intra op. CMS, EMS, PMS, holla back. For doctors, it ain't fair. These vendors act like they all kind of whack. Eight million stories out there, docs can't take it. After this disaster, half of y'all won't make it. How to train your dragon. Hotmail isn't hot mail. If some be saying it's epic, we saying it's epic fail. Electronic silo, teams not talking. Paperless, they say, but whole trees we dropping. Props to case management. Long live the RT, long live the pharmacist. Whole team definitely hates, hates. Not blind us to the reason why we care. Patient's face reminds us. Designs like Hippocrates to tap the app agilely to magically the team works. Let's bite the apple, Steve. Caught up in your inbox. Now you're insane. Good docs gone mad. The clinic's filled with them. Nursing, they the heart of everything. Data entry got them hurting. Life starts when the shift ends. Ten years of school, graduated to the OR. Mommy busts a whipple, she deserves a better damn chart. Autocorrect, turning chantix into champion. Patient needs a sleeper, 30 clicks for an ambient. Thank you, 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 thank you. Um, thank you very much. Yeah. Should I, should I do one more or no? Yeah. Uh, now, hospital readmissions, Maine, they're a problem. So it turns out, you know, in the hospital, there's so many failures and gaps in care that we miss and technology can, can start to heal those. So we're turning to everybody here to try to fix it. But at the minimum, we need to understand the nature of the problem. And the problem is best understood through R&B. Now, usually I don't do this, but uh, 
Go on, head on DC and with little previews of the readmit. Now I'm not trying to be rude. Hey, CHF is killing you. Lungs congested up with fluid. Well, my census is 32. That's why I'm all up in your grill. Trying to get you to a Lasix pill. You must be an HMO. The way you'll not be paying the bill. DC to home. Hey, you give me that. Bouncing right back to the ER. Crackles, wheezing, edema. Why do I rush to the museum? It's my 10-3 admission. Not the sharpest clinician. But if all the CHF patient ought to eat Kentucky fried chicken. Soul care givers the sun. I'm like, so what? He's one. There's a picking, picking. All he had to do was manage the pump. Bounce, 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 bounce back. Bounce, bounce, bounce back. Now it's like murder, she wrote. Once I get you out the door, PCP screaming, whoa. Medicare won't pay no more. Girl, I'm feeling that you're healing. I'm just hoping and wishing. All of those bloody BMs mean a colitis remission. So give me that. Blue the color up. Bouncing right back to the ER. Found down in diarrhea. Press gain, he scores sub zero. One more readmission. No love from the Joint Commission. Cause my one day pregnant is on tapers. By the way, her colon's now missing. DC creatinine one. Now it's seven point something. It's a freaking weekend. Who am I gonna get to place a quinton? Crystal's popping on the joint aspiration. I guess I miss Coach C on his bed break conciliation. He got swelling on the left. He's flaccid on the right. The INR is 12, so they'll be paging all night. And after the stroke, there's the aspiration. Yeah, and after he chokes, there's the intubation. Yeah, round about four, we hit the station. And take it to the room for to the unit now. Ventilator go. At least he's off on my floor. Yeah. Don't need to see him no more. Come till on. I'm subpoenaed for court. Let's now. prevent readmission. Manage those chronic conditions. Each time preparing the hand up. Move along to other clinicians. Instructions are clear. clear. Only if the patient can hear. hear. Take some freaking tweaking if we're gonna get our feet to it here. Girl, we up on this wall. Right and easy, no. Reconciling man. Thank you very much, guys.